Good afternoon. My name is Richard Fateman. I'd like to thank Nancy Blackman and Stanford University for inviting me to give this guest lecture in CS50. Uh, as some of you may know, I'm a computer science professor at Berkeley, and uh, my background in this area goes back about 20 years when I was working on a PhD dissertation uh, jointly at MIT and Harvard on Maxima, which is a program which is some, in some ways a predecessor of Mathematica. Uh, the topic I'm, topic I'm going to talk about today is why Mathematica is not my favorite programming system. Uh, I'm not going to say that Maxima is my favorite programming system, but I'll leave you to think about the important issues about programming systems and mathematics in general. Uh, I think that if I understand the setup here, you'll, you'll be able to ask questions. Uh, I think what you should do is probably wave your hand to catch my attention and uh, then pick up the microphone. So please feel free to, to uh, ask questions. Here's an outline of the talk I'm going to give today. For a start, I'm going to give a brief history of, of computer algebra systems. I'm going to talk about the issue of uh, hype versus reality and uh, the question of what is mathematics and is it, for example, a trademark. Uh, I'm going to spend a fair amount of time talking about problems in Mathematica, in Mathematica as a programming language, in Mathematica as a collection of algorithms. And then I'm going to talk about uh, what we might look for objectively in a mathematics system. Uh, for example, we probably want interactivity, we want a good language, we want numerical computing, graphics. Uh, now that we're used to mathematical, we probably want symbolic and algebraic computing. We probably want something along the lines of knowledge representation, something which I'm not going to define at this time. Um, and then I'll, I'll come to some conclusions. Can we fix what's wrong with Mathematica? And I'm sure every one of you has encountered something that doesn't seem quite right. And then some general conclusions. I have a list of people I'd <coughs> like to thank who have participated in uh, commenting on early drafts of a paper I've written, a review of Mathematica, as well as uh, comments from people on a net news bulletin board called psi.math.symbolic, as well as a math, math group that's run by Steve Christensen. Uh, he maintains a mailing list about Mathematica that perhaps you've participated in. A uh, surprising number of people not listed prefer to remain anonymous uh, but there are a bunch. All right, so let's get on to some history. And I'm going to be very sketchy about this because it is possible to uh, refer to some references about, about this topic. Uh, the earliest mention of symbolic mathematics by computer actually goes back to about 1844. You say, well, how could that be? Digital computers didn't exist then. The answer is uh, Charles Babbage's friend, uh, Countess uh, 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 it's uh, Lady Lovelace, Count uh, uh, Ada, Lady Ada, who's, uh, for whom the programming language is named, anticipated the use of computers, digital computers, and Babbage's analytical engine for the use of symbolic manipulation in her early writings, 1844. But if we go to more recent history, uh, in, the, in the decade of the 60s, we saw the emergence of a whole slew of programs, some of which have, have faded from sight, but others which have uh, continued to grow and, and uh, prosper. Uh, Altran, MathLab, Maxima, Reduce, Scratchpad, PM, which stood for Polynomial Manipulator, all were programmed in various ways in the 60s. There were also some key programs like Sin and Saint, which were symbolic integrators. Uh, Today we have uh, the descendants of Scratchpad. Uh, the most recent version is Axiom, which is now being distributed by the Numerical Algorithms Group. Uh, they're distinctive because they take a much uh, higher ground view of symbolic computation and say that this is a matter for uh, abstraction and categorization. And in some ways, they have uh, done some very nice work. MuMath and its successor Derive run on IBM PCs, and they're, they're distinctive because they're quite small. 
and run in 640k bytes and do quite a number of neat things. Uh, Maple, and for that matter SMP and its successor Mathematica, are in some ways a reaction to the uh, 1960s systems in an attempt to make things faster and sleeker uh, using newer software engineering technology. And there are a whole bunch of others, and I list these, uh, uh, and I may have omitted some. I know that, uh, uh, in fact, uh, I have. Uh, Theorist runs only on the Macintosh. I understand it just got a five-mouse review from Mac user. Uh, SAC, uh, Jackal, and Form are all free programs, and uh, have somewhat specialized domains of interest. All right, let me, let me give you a, uh, a brief preview of the conclusion. Uh, and really, the issue is, uh, in my view, what is it that Mathematica is? Is it all it claims to do? Is it all it claims it should be doing? Or is it uh, more marketing and less technology? Well, the hype is clear. The claim is Mathematica is a system for doing mathematics. What is it really? Uh, at, by this time in, this, in, the, in the quarter, you realize Mathematica manipulates data structures that, at best, imperfectly represent some of mathematics. It uses algorithms and heuristics that are, I think, known to you to give outright wrong answers, at least sometimes. Okay. Has everyone encountered a wrong answer from Mathematica here? Yeah? Were they all ones that were told to you that would be wrong? Or did you discover new ones? How many have discovered a new, uh, as yet on, uh, yeah, one, two, three, four, a few, yeah. Yeah, I should raise my hand, too. Uh, uh, Wolfram Research, the vendor of Mathematica, considers the fact that it gives wrong answers sometimes acceptable on the grounds that computer algebra is like a physical experiment with experimental error, and therefore the results must be checked. I think this attitude... <laughs> this attitude is wrong. <laughs> Gee, do we have a... Uh <laughs> Can you still hear me? Yeah. I can't see into the booth back there. All right. Uh, uh, WRI, or at least spokespeople for it, dismissed the notion that Mathematica should aspire to be logically correct by saying that's merely an academic viewpoint. Um, perhaps it's only an academic viewpoint, but when you have other commercial systems that are uh, available and are more correct, you have to begin to think that maybe Mathematica should aspire to be more academic. Um, what, what's a good example? I, uh, how, how does Mathematica fail to do mathematics? Uh, the simplest example I came up with was uh, asking it to plot sine of x, S-I-N of x. You say, well, it's got to be able to plot sine of x if it understands mathematics. So let's ask it to plot sine of x. Here, here's, here's a plot. Uh, Maybe some of you have seen other plots like this. This is the sine of x, x going from 0 to 48 pi. Here's, here's 0, and here's about uh, 50. So sine of x is, is a flat curve from 0 to 50, and then it starts wiggling. Now, whatever this is, it's certainly not mathematics. So I said, well, maybe it's, it's sampling sampling at an unfortunate rate. This is aliasing, and we all know that's not a good thing. So let me just scoot it over a little bit and try to give Mathematica an edge. And instead of plotting from 0 to 48 pi, I said, let's plot it from 0 to 48.01 pi. And now you get this. Now, you say, well, that's a really strange kind of thing. It's even stranger if you look at the, the uh, y-axis here, because it goes from 0 to 0.03. Let's put both of those plots on the same piece of paper. And you see 
what has happened. Yes, it's, it's com computed beats, but see there's a little line there just above the axis? Yeah. That's one of those plots. And the other one is, is this, this uh, weird uh, comb with a handle. So it's not doing mathematics. At least the plotting program is kind of bogus. It's a nice plotting program, and it does many clever things, but it's not mathematics. Now, let me point out some additional problems. I'm not going to be able to go into uh, uh, many of them, but I do have a paper. I have some copies of a paper I gave to your TA. Uh, it's, a, it's a review of Mathematica that appeared in the journal on symbolic computation several years ago. And uh, one would say, well, several years ago, they must have fixed all those bugs by now. Well, I was very careful to try to uh, not discuss problems in Mathematica that were merely bugs and could be fixed. I was talking mostly about what I consider to be design errors and not bugs. And I think the, the, the review stands the test of time. Very few of the things in that article, some of which I'm going to talk about today, have been, in fact, corrected. Some of the things. Uh, I don't know if Nancy has discussed this, but there are no canonical forms in Mathematica. There's essentially one data representation, and that is used for all of the manipulations, or nearly all of the manipulations. And sometimes that representation is inadequate. Um, some of the representations uh, that you see, for example, in series, if you use the power series expansion programs or modifications of that data representation, but they're, they're not keyed to efficiency. There's a very poor debugging environment, although it has gotten much better since uh, version 1. There's still no type checking or type inference. If you've tried to use the tracing facilities, the information is quite messy and gives you a lot of information on things you don't know anything about and not too much information on what you asked about. Much of the source that would be relevant to, to finding bugs is inaccessible. Uh, something I found rather distressing is that there's a very poor semantic description for the language and for the commands. And to find out what is efficient, you basically have to keep on stabbing at different ways of writing the same program. Perhaps you've encountered this too, using lists or arrays or uh, functions or iterations. You get different results for different methods. Another technical problem, which you may not have thought about, but I did, uh, is the fact that there's a sole source for the system and the language. So that if you decide that you should write your programs for your classes or your students or uh, your friends in Mathematica, you are constraining them to buy a software system from Wolfram Research. This is not the case if you were to write your programs in Fortran or Lisp or Scheme or any of a number of other systems. Now, you say, well, couldn't someone else write another system that parsed the same language as Mathematica? And the answer is, well, yeah, sure, you could. In fact, I did. But you might be contacted by their lawyers, as I have been. All right, let's get on to some, some specific problems. Now, I think the major problem that permeates Mathematica and is difficult to get around is that uh, Mathematica asserts implicitly that all unknown functions and all unknown names of symbols are somehow generic. This, this term actually has a very specific meaning in computer science, but it's not exactly what Mathematica uh, means by it. So here's an example. In Mathematica version 1.2, if a function f and a function l a, a, and a, a uh, value l are unknown, the system will nevertheless replace the limit as x approaches l of f of x by f of l. Now, we learn in calculus, freshman calculus, that the limit often depends on what f and l are. And the interesting problems are those where you can't just evaluate the function at that point. Now, this particular error has been patched in versions 2.0 and later. That is, the limit function has been patched. But every other place in the system that I've encountered it it's still there. Uh, let me give you an example. If you take the integral of x to the n, dx, 
you say, what is the integral? It says x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1, plus a constant, except it doesn't say that. But that's not true. It's not true for all values of n. If n is minus 1, then the answer is log of n, a log of x. So it still takes a generic view. This is a challenging problem. I don't mean to, to belittle it and say that everyone else has done this right. But it was noticed in 1971 in Maxima. And a large part of the effort from 1971 to about 74 in Maxima was devoted to trying to figure out how to improve the situation. The situation can be dealt with to some extent by inserting assumptions and declarations into a system. Ultimately, I think by 1974, we realized that a, a better design from the, from the bottom up, including assumptions and assertions and declarations, would be needed. But by that time, Maxim was pretty much formed. It was formed about as much as Mathematica is formed now, and it's very difficult to go back and rewrite all of your code. It's especially hard to rewrite all of your code uh, if you don't have the original staff and the programming language is not flexible enough to allow you to replace pieces easily. I think that probably uh, Wolfram didn't realize its importance or perhaps thought, uh, well, thought it was perhaps it was too hard to do. Now, uh, as an example of something that Mathematica, <coughs> Mathematica gets wrong and has gotten wrong since version 1.0 when it was first pointed out is this integral, which is not an entirely made up integral. It actually comes out in freshman calculus problem books. This integral, the integral from minus pi to pi of this expression, I'm not going to read it out loud. You can see it. Uh, comes out as 0 in Mathematica version 1.1 and 1.2. Unfortunately, if x is less than 1, <coughs> the answer is 2 pi. And if x is equal to 1, the answer is pi. Mathematica 2.0 and later give an answer that's approximately this. I've run it through their, their tech typesetting system to get this answer. If you see it on your screen, it's, it's a fair amount clumsier. This answer actually encodes two of the three correct answers. It's sometimes 0 and it's sometimes 2 pi. But if you're faced with this expression, what are you going to do with it? You're going to just beat your head against the wall and try to figure out how to simplify it. And you're going to thrash around, and you'll finally find the power expand command. And that fixes it. Unfortunately, the power expand uh, command reduces the expression to 0, one of the possible answers. Now, the early versions of Mathematica did not have power expand. They just went ahead and expanded it and gave you 0. The later versions of Mathematica say, I'm going to give you a very complicated expression that you won't be able to figure out. But I'm going to give you a tool. It's a, it's a knife with no handle. And you're going to have to pick it up and use it. And if you bleed, it's your fault. You picked up the handle, and there is none. So that's what power expand is. It's, it's, it's a double-edged razor, no handle. You use it at your own risk. And uh, Mathematica, in its design, would like you to take on all responsibility for errors following that time. Too bad. Uh, incidentally, other systems get that one right. Not all, but some. Yeah, question. Yeah. Which one? Uh, I believe uh, Maxima and possibly Maple 5 version 2 get that right. And I believe Derive, the one that runs on a 640 kilobyte IBM PC. It actually runs on an HP 95 calculator that you can put in your pocket. Does anyone have one here? You try it. OK. Uh, all right, the next area in which Mathematica and I differ is in approximate numbers. Uh, Mathematica uh, was written by people who 
by and large, were not computer scientists or numerical analysts. They were physicists. And there are a lot of smart physicists. Wolfram is a very smart physicist. But often physicists are not educated in numerical analysis, and they feel that all they need to know about approximate numbers comes from physics 1A, where you're given a, a meter stick and you're asked to measure uh, heights of columns of water and uh, uh, temperatures and so forth. And you're told to uh, take the numbers that you get, whether they're three digits or four digits, and, and judge the best you can. And when you combine them in certain ways, you drop the digits that you're unsure of. Well, you can do this with computers. The problem is computers do many, many arithmetic operations. And if you use these kinds of rules, they're called significance arithmetic. If you use them for a whole sequence of calculations, what happens is all significance disappears. And that's why computer designers and numerical analysts don't use significance arithmetic. The loss in precision is too drastic, and it's often unwarranted. Precision ratchets down in your calculations, sometimes with disastrous effect. Now, I didn't know that I would have a uh, Macintosh to, to work with live here, so I prepared these slides. Uh, here's an example uh, <coughs> where we start with a number, A. It's 1.11111, one, 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 a bunch of ones. I think there are about 18 ones. And now uh, we say do, if you, if you want to copy any of this down, the first two lines are really enough. And you don't have to get the number of ones correct. You say do a is assigned 2 times a minus a. And do that 55 times. Now, for a system that does mathematics, assigning a the value of 2 times a minus a should leave a unchanged. 2a minus a is a whether you do it once or twice or 55 times. So here we do it 55 times. Um, actually, you can experiment maybe 38 times will be enough, depending on what version of mathematics you have. Some number will do it. And you get 0. You get 0.0. .0. You say, well, that's not right, because it should be 1.111, 11111, et cetera. Or maybe with round off, the last one should be a, a 0 or a the fact of the matter is maxima, uh, maxima. Math Mathematica has made many of them zero. And if you add numbers to this zero, you get some strange results. You add one to that zero, and you get two. You say, what is the accuracy of A, and what is the precision? You get zero accuracy, zero precision. Let's compute a few numbers. What's A minus 1, A minus 2, A minus 5? A minus 1 is zero. A minus 2 is zero. It's a slightly different zero. It only has, uh, this is 0, 0.00, this is 0, 0.0. And a minus 5 is minus 4. You say, well, OK, I give up. Is a the same as a minus 1? <laughs> it is. Well, if the only place that this happened was in this example, you could scold me as being a pointy-headed academic and you know, who cares? This particular example is a synthesis of a bug that was discovered by a researcher doing statistical analysis of data. It was David Jacobson at Hewlett Packard, just down the road from here. And he said, how could this be? It took him a week to figure it out. And then he came up with this, well, somewhat more elaborate but comparable example. Um, Here's something else that goes wrong. And this is, this is a really quite a different issue. Uh, how many of you are computer science majors or have an inkling about strong interest in computer science? No one here. It's mostly applied type people. Let me go through this example briefly, because it, it's perhaps esoteric in the sense of dealing with computer languages in a strange way. Uh, first of all, I have to clear the clear A because A was that funny zero, and I didn't show it on the slide. Uh, now, if you type A gets 1 plus A, you may have discovered that in, in Mathematica, you get into a loop. Have, a, have you tried that? A is assigned 1 plus A. It says well, you have to keep on adding A to 1 until it, until it stops. That's the way 
Mathematica works, and it never stops. It keeps on growing. In fact, it grows to uh, 250 plus a plus 1, and then something bad happens. <coughs> this, this was run on a, um, on a Sun workstation, but you get similar bugs, I hope, on Macintoshes and other computers, unless it actually runs out of memory and dies. I think that it doesn't do that anymore. Now, here's a little function. Uh, g of x is, a, is, is defined to be block, which means you have a local variables. Uh, a local variable a is assigned x, and a is assigned 1 plus a. What does this do? Well, you try it out. g of s re responds with 1 plus s. g of 3 responds with 4. You get the feeling that what this program does is it adds 1 to its argument. So 3 gets 4, s gets 1 plus s. g of a gives you an error. It says recursion limit, recursion limit, recursion depth of 256 exceeded, and it gives you a funny answer here. You say, oh, let's fix this. The error is in using block instead of module. Let's just use module. We're told, and this is a new an innovation in version 2, that this, this uh, problem that comes from some computer scientists pointing out that scope is handled wrong in Mathematica, this can be fixed by using module. So we do the same thing with h. h is the same as g, except block and module have been interchanged. Uh, h of a is, in fact, 1 plus a. And in fact, h of s is 1 plus s, and so forth. Um, let's ignore this for, for the moment and ask, what is h of a dollar sign 13? And where did I get a dollar sign 13? Well, if, if h is always going to add 1 to whatever it's given, it should give a dollar sign 13 plus 1. Nope. Because recursion depth of 256 exceeded. So you say, how is that? Let me try that again. And you type h of a dollar sign 13 again. And it says, oh, uh, a dollar sign 13 plus 1. So for that one time, and that one time only, you got recursion depth exceeded. So somewhere in the universe of all possible things, there is a symbol for which this program doesn't work. This is usually considered unacceptable. OK, another, another issue. Now, this is, this is separate from the others. This is how does one deal with functions in, in Mathematica as uh, mathematical functions? Now, mathematical functions, as opposed to programming functions, are defined over a certain domain, and they have certain values. You can think of them as maps from functions, from values to, to the function values. Uh, how do you do this in Mathematica? Well, if you have a piecewise function, what you do is you take um, a function, and you say, define it in this region with one expression, and define it in another region with another expression. Let's look at this example here. Um, let's define a function f of x as sine of x for all x greater than 0. Let's define the same function f of x to be x for x less than or equal to 0. There's nothing wrong with this function. We can draw a picture of it. It starts, it looks sort of like this. In fact, I, I drew a graph of it. I, uh, I think I'll, it'll just be a waste of time if I do this with Mathematica live. But the plot is it's perfectly reasonable. It looks like that if I plot from minus pi to pi. Uh, you and I could differentiate it. We could integrate it. We could do all kinds of things with it. We could evaluate it at a given point, evaluate the derivative at a given point. What can Mathematica do? Mathematica can evaluate it at a point. That's all. It doesn't know anything else about that function. If you ask, what is its derivative? It says f prime of x. It doesn't really know anything about that. What is its derivative evaluated at 3? It doesn't know anything about that either. It doesn't really know about mathematical functions defined in the only way that you are able to tell it about. Say, so, well, but patterns are so handy. Well. Let me show you some things about patterns. Yes, patterns are handy. They don't work for that example, but they certainly work for simplification. 
Now think about that. Let's let's just go through an example. This is a um, log. You know about log from high school. You learned about log in uh, oh I don't know tenth grade maybe. Uh, I'm not going to use capital L O G because if I do that, too many things break, and you have to unprotect it and do various other things. So I'm, I'll use the name L N. So L N of x over y, we can define a pattern to simplify that to log of x minus log of y. That's OK. In fact, it works. If we say log of r over s, we get log of r minus log of s. So it looks like we've done the right thing. It works. Our example works. But then we try log of a half. And uh, that doesn't work. Well, it looks just like x over y to us, but it's, it turns out it's not 1 over 2 is really a rational number. It's not a quotient at all. Oops. We s do we really have to know that much about the internal representation of stuff in Mathematica? Well, if you're going to write patterns, you really do. Let's try another one. Log of r divided by square root of s. Well, gee, that looks awfully like that x over y. And that's not a rational number either. So why didn't that one work? Does anyone know why that one didn't work? No? No guesses? Yeah, Ron, Ron Abitzer knows. And he's written systems like this. <laughs> the square root of s does not occur in this expression. You say, it's right there. What do you mean? No, it doesn't. There's s to the power minus a half occurs in this expression. This is not a quotient. It's a product. It's r times the square root of, uh, I'm sorry, it's r times s to the minus a half power. It's a product, not a quotient. The display lies to you. Same thing with log of 1 over y. It's really y to the minus 1 power. So if we figure this out, we say, all right, the log of x times y is the log of x plus the log of y. Now these previous three examples work. In fact, log of r times s times t even works, recursively using this pattern. Oops. I lied. Log of 1 over y doesn't work, because that's not a product at all. It's a power. It's y to the minus 1. But log of r over square root of s, that does work. Because it is a product. It's r times something. All right, here, here's a better pattern. Log of x, where x is irrational, is the log of the numerator minus, minus the log of the denominator. Now that one works. Um, and we have to add another rule. Log of x to the power y is y times log of x. Now log of 1 over y works. In fact, uh, log of r divided by square root of s now works. We ask, well, what do we have left here? We can ask about log, question mark, question mark, ln. I don't know if there's a better way of doing this on Macintoshes, but it prints out everything that we've told it. This first rule turns out to be now entirely useless. And in some ways, we're really fortunate, because when I've played with Mathematica, more often than not, the first rule that I type in is slightly wrong, and it interferes with all of the others. And the only way I can get that, the, the new improved rules to take effect is to repeatedly clear all the rules having to do with that function. It's a very inconvenient way of programming. It's not incremental at all. It's sort of decremental. Everything you do previously has to be undone before you do something new. Um, Can you trust the answers? Here's an example. In fact, if I can uncover this page I have here. Now, that's, yeah, here we are. Here we are. Uh, here's an expression. Let's integrate it. Mathematica has a pretty nice program for integrating. This is the, this is the expression typeset a little bit better. You integrate that expression from 0 to infinity. It loads some packages. And it gives you this expression. Well, that's, we don't really believe that that's 
as nice as it could be. So we call simplify, and we get this pi times tangent of pi times q over 2p divided by 2p. And uh, Naple gets this answer. Maxima gets this answer. Uh, although Maxima asks a question about some relevant characteristics, um, the answer is wrong. It's been wrong at least since 1836. Uh, this is actually a scanned in image from uh, the 1836 um, table of integrals. It's actually in French, the title is Nouvelle Table d'Integ Définie. Burens de Haan uh, was the principal author of this in 1836. That's tangent, but everything else is the same. Uh, the reason this is wrong is when q is uh, 2 and p is 1, the answer is infinite. And this, this formula, it's from 0 to infinity, does not cover that situation. All right, um, let's look at this. If we actually substitute in p being 1 and q being 2 in the answer that mathematically gives us, we get for the integral 0. If we substitute in p being 1 and q being 2 in the integrand and then redo the integral, then we get infinity. So Mathematica has integrated the generic version of this integral and gotten the answer that's wrong for the particular integral. How many of those do you think can be patched one after another as bugs? An awful lot. So the point is, Mathematica learns about singularities, about errors, one at a time, painfully. And how large will the system be when everything is right? Well, it depends. If you, if you, if you try to design it from the beginning, to understand about singularities, you might have a chance. If you patch it one bug at a time, the system will continue to grow indefinitely. And you'll never have any assurance of the next singularity being detected or not. Here, here's an example. And this was pointed out to uh, Wolfram Research years ago. Uh, take sine of 6x divided by sine of x. Solve that expression equal to 0 for x. Version 1.2 says, x is 0. And it gives you a warning saying some solutions may not be found. It doesn't tell you that the solution that it found may not be a solution, which is also the case. Version 2.1 says uh, x is complex infinity or x is 0, also warning you that some solutions may not be found, not telling you that the two it found were also wrong. Version 2 finally gets it right. It, gives an empty list. It says no solutions were found. Well, version 1.2 didn't have an n solve, but version 2 does have an n solve. It got it wrong. Version 2.2 almost got it right, except it gave an error message in the middle. Indeterminate expression 0, I think that's 0, times 10 to the minus 39, uh, 309 times complex infinity encountered. So you figure out what that means. All right, enough about poking at particular issues in Mathematica. I, I, I hope that um, I've given you the feeling that I'm not intending, at least, to poke at particular bugs, but at design issues. That if you were really to design a program that dealt with mathematics, you'd want to design it so that it worked on the general case, on the specific case, and was not a collection of patches. Um, but now let's, let's look at what else a computer algebra system should be. Now, Mathematica is more than a computer algebra system. Um, it's a graphic system. It's perhaps a, a library system or programming language. In fact, uh, Steve Wolfram would like his, his language to be adopted as an introductory programming language for uh, computer science students and engineers and so forth. And there, there may be some justification for it, I think, for engineers uh, and scientists, as I su suspect most of you are, to learn about the power of Mathematica. But I'm not sure I would 
uh, push it as a, uh, an ideal computer programming language. But let's look at what, what does it look like as, as a system compared to some of the other systems. Uh, in terms of interactivity, when you type in, you're only typing in to a teletype-like scrolling uh, image, at least the mathematic as I've seen. Uh, compare this, for example, to the theorist or, or Milo, whose author is actually sitting here, where you can pick and move expressions and sub-expressions on the screen. In some systems, experimental systems, you can actually write expressions with a, with a pen on a tablet. There's no typeset math output. Maple 5 version 2 has typeset output. That is, the exponents are different sizes, and subscripts are different sizes, and so forth. Theorist does a very good job of this also. There is high plotting quality, but in most versions of mathematics, it's static. You can't take a surface and turn it. Uh, Theorist and Maple allow you to do this in some versions, but only expensive ones, I think, of Mathematica allow you to do that. And uh, once you've plotted something, it's not easy to change what you've, uh, what you've done. You have to replot it. Theorist allows you to do this much more interactively. Uh, in terms of programming language, uh, since you're not mostly computer science people, I guess I I could either skip this or I could say outrageous things and <laughs> do something else. But uh, here, there, there are two general views. One is a programming language should include everything you'll ever need, everything, everything and the kitchen sink. I'll call it the omnibus view. A programming language should be like, uh, you know, it's a bus. It carries lots of passengers. It, ha it, has, it has treads to go over uh, sand. It has skis to go on snow. Um, it has a wheel in the back in case you uh, uh, want to go uphill, it keeps the back from, from uh, hitting the, uh, the driveway, you know. It has a little sail, it has a, a turret with a small cannon on it. It's all prepared for anything. Of course, for any particular purpose, uh, it's kind of clumsy. You would not want to pick your child up from elementary school in this, although maybe sometimes you would. Uh, there's the other view, which is the extensible view. And this is taken by some other programming languages. And the idea is you're not going to have everything in it. You're going to have enough in it to build whatever you need. And those people who need more will build whatever more they need. Uh, so the picture here is of Lego blocks, something that you've probably encountered as children. Mathem Mathematica overloads. The syntax, it has over 1,100 commands it ha in, or built-in objects in the thin kernel. It has, I think, 1,500 in the fat kernel. I don't know what they call the fat kernel, larger kernel. It uses all single character tokens, many two character tokens, some three character tokens. At least one reserved object is 22 characters long. It is an example of an omnibus programming system. And if you don't like what it has, it's difficult to extend in a smooth fashion. It uses cryptic language like this one. Actually, the slide uh, ran out of space on the printer there. The rest of that program is here. Uh, if any of you are interested in looking at it later, I can stick around. It actually is correct. It, it parses and it evaluates. Uh, it's mysterious, unsafe. And I think it has somewhat botched semantics. That's an opinion. We made a fuss about approximate computing already. But to be serious about numerical computing, it's not enough just to have the occasional large number, you know, pi to 100 places. You really have to do high speed computing. That's why people in the sciences use computers. Uh, should they use Mathematica for all their scientific computing? Well, certainly not writing programs natively in Mathematica. Uh, there is an add-on product, I think it's called Intercall, which allows access from Mathematica to numerical libraries written in Fortran. And that may be a good idea, but still, 
if the language that you're going to learn is Mathematica and you do not know Fortran, then you will be somewhat at a loss as to how to change and modify the Fortran programs. The, uh, the second issue on this slide, and I think uh, I'm coming close towards the end of my uh, uh, topics here, is knowledge representation. And this is a complicated issue. And uh, in Mathematica, well, this is, a, this is actually a typesetting command here. In Mathematica, how would you represent x is greater than 0? Now, of course, you could type in x is greater than 0. And Mathematica would say, sure. And then you, you could ask, is x greater than 0? It'd say, I don't know. I mean, all you did was you said x is greater than 0, so it's stored it away somewhere. But it doesn't know how to use that information. The integrals that involved x, that integral with respect to t, whose value differed depending on whether x was greater than or less than 1, it doesn't know what x is. It doesn't ask. None of the programs in Mathematica ask about the sign of objects that have not been fully defined. Either it's a number, like 3, and it knows whether it's positive or negative. Or it's a symbol, and it doesn't know anything about it, even if you told it. None of the programs that have been written use that information. Well, you could get Mathematica to know about those things, just as you could get it to know about functions defined in a piecewise way. And you could get Mathematica to do a whole bunch of other things that I've pointed out as flaws. The problem is you'd have to rewrite almost the whole thing. And that's just not going to happen soon. And it may not happen ever. Which brings me to some questions here. Final questions. Can it be fixed? Can Mathematica be fixed? Uh, well, this is partly an economic question. Will enough paying customers demand it? Or will the competition force it? If Mathematica were the only system to get these questions wrong, probably they'd have to change or go out of business. If enough paying customers demand it, what would they do? Well, it depends on whether they can get enough paying customers who don't demand it. I don't know. I'm not a marketeer. Partly, it's a technical question. Do the solutions exist now? Is it possible to solve the problems? Well, it's possible to solve some of the problems. It's possible to solve uh, many problems in a practical manner better than Mathematica does. But not all of the solutions exist right now. We do not know how to automate all of analytical mathematics. We know a fair amount about automating algebra. And those pieces of analysis that can be mapped onto algebra can often be solved algebraically. Will Mathematica be the last programming language you will ever have to learn? Well, I don't know. I don't know. For some of you, maybe. But I would say that it's not going to be the last language you will have to learn if you are going to do serious programming. There are other programming languages and systems with advantages over Mathematica that will not go away. Like a thousand times speed up on problems. Now, a factor of a thousand is a big difference. It's the difference between, what is it, three seconds, three seconds and a uh, day? Something like that. There are things that you would do on a computer a thousand times faster that you wouldn't consider doing otherwise. So you may have to write programs in C or Fortran or even Lisp or some other programming language if you're serious. In fact, Mathematica might not even be the last symbolic mathematics system you will have to learn to use if the uh, packages and the facilities in Mathematica don't keep pace with the competition. Here's a question I'm, I'm often asked. 
should Mathematica be used as the first programming language? And maybe many of you are in that situation. How many of you are learning Mathematica as a first programming language? How many of you learned BASIC first as a first programming language? Most, almost ev everyone. How many of you learned Pascal as a first programming language? First, you've learned Pascal since BASIC. Yeah. How many have learned Lisp? Uh, a couple. All right. Well, uh, does anyone have an opinion here? Should Mathematica be taught as the first programming language? Now you know how I feel. <laughs> I see some thumbs down, but uh, uh, there are advocates of, of teaching Mathematica as the first programming language, or in fact incorporating it in, in a cal calculus course. Um, I think. Both of these ideas are kind of bad. Certainly in computer science education, I think one of the roles of teaching programming is to demystify the, the practice and to show that it is scientific and not an art. And Mathematica seems to present it more as uh, somewhere between an art and black magic. And I think that's wrong for a programming language, at least an introductory programming language. On the other hand, there is a place for uh, some connection between programming languages, scientific visualization, um, constructive mathematics, education, calculus. And uh, so, so I think there is, there is some, something worth pursuing there. Um, I think the idea that, I mean, think back to calculus. For some of you, it's a lot easier than it is for me. Uh, you spent time plotting functions. If you spent 15 minutes plotting a function, like a, a cubic polynomial, and then you got it wrong, what did you learn from that? Not an awful lot. Now, if you had a, if you had a program do that plotting, well, that would, that would probably assist in your learning higher functions. Yes? I would object to that. Even if you get the plot wrong, the insight you get from the process is a lot more worthy than ac actually getting the result right. I mean, suppose you're plotting 1 over x minus 1. You know that there is a singularity at 1. You know how the function curves up mm -hmm. or curves down. And you get an idea about it. At, at least that's how I learned calculus. So it gives you a lot more insight than just typing it in yeah. Mathematica. And that's why, I mean, like, why Mathematica isn't good? Because it doesn't have the insight that some of the human beings do have about Well, this is the lear learning through doing yeah. idea. Otherwise, it would provide you almost no insight. Well, I, I think the other, the other view that I've heard is that uh, there are calculators, handheld calculators, that do plotting also. So if, if you really want a computer to do plotting for calculus purposes, You'd have everyone buy his or her own calculator for thirty-five dollars that does plotting, but I, you know, I agree with you that this hands-on approach is is useful, but you can also see where someone might say, well, some functions are interesting and yet too hard to plot by hand. So there, there's a plotting simple functions by hand with asymptotes and zeros and so forth. I would go for plotting more elaborate functions. It comes a point where a program helps. I think you'd agree, too. Yes, question back there. Well, that is true, but you also have the case, and you pointed some of these out, when Mathematica simply gets it wrong. Yeah. And if you don't know when it's getting it wrong because you haven't plotted a similar function, maybe a simpler function in the past, yeah. you're in deep trouble. Well, that's, a, that's really another issue. Can you, is it possible to write a plotting program that's never fooled? And, and it is. It is possible using tools like interval arithmetic. It's not does not happen to be something that Mathematica does right now. I, in fact, wrote a program using Mathematica, in part, that would not be fooled by those funny plots. And if you're interested, I can show you more about this later. Um, finally, is Mathematica useful for, for problem solving? And sure it is. I use it from time to time. And if you've been using it at all in, in other courses, uh, you've probably found it of some use. Um, I think within limits, it does fine. Uh, in some ways, uh, some of the other computer algebra systems are better. In some ways, they're worse. 
I think most of them are great fun. And I hope that in whatever you do after this, uh, you continue to look at computers as tools and Mathematica and other programming systems, computer algebra systems, is one of the tools that you can use in other courses and uh, in later life when you eventually graduate from this great institution. OK, thank you. If there are questions, I guess I can stay around. And uh, if you want questions on tape, we have about another minute more. Yes? Yeah, I, um, I have a question. The concern, I mean, really, what alternatives would that be? I mean, is it possible to get some kind of intermediate? I mean, what I find myself doing all the time now is using mathematics to develop problems because it has a rather intuitive syntax. The fact that it only has one data type uh, makes it quite easy to develop develop the models I mm -hmm. do. But you know, then as you say, I mean, it's about a thousand times slower than actually taking well, everything, putting it into C and or C++. Well, and it it is possible to take programs that are, uh, or expressions that are uh, printed out in Mathematica and convert them to Fort Fortran. But you have to be very careful because uh, I would guess the people who did that program have yet to, f well, they've yet to fix one bug, which I pointed out some time ago. If you type in Fortran form one half, it provides you with the Fortran card image with one half on it. Now in Fortran, who knows what one slash two is? It's zero, not 0 0.5. So it doesn't do a perfect job at that, but that's one way. And many systems, every, every algebraic manipulation system, from the smallest to the largest, has some way of producing expressions in a form that could then be fed back into Fortran or C uh, or some other language. So maybe that, that would provide a solution. Yeah, but do you think it's possible to come up with some intermediate? I mean, I would be happy to use a system uh, that, uh, you know, could somehow... What you, would what you want is, is a system which would compile an expression in Mathematica so it could be evaluated rapidly. Usefully, yeah. Usefully. Uh, I think it's possible. Uh, it's perhaps something that Wolfram should think about. It's not, I don't see it on the immediate horizon. Any other question there? Yes? So you probably approve uh, the syntax of a language and the semantics and everything, but you think it's a bad implementation? Is it, I'm sorry, I... Is it a bad implementation? Is it a bad implementation? It's a secret implementation. Uh, I, I can't look at the insides. Uh, uh, I, in fact, re-implemented a parser for Mathematica, and uh, I found some failings in the language, some ambiguities uh, in writing a parser for it. So uh, I would say the design is, is uh, flaky. I don't care for a lot of the design decisions, uh, but I don't know about their implementation specifically. It seems to be fast enough at parsing. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. <laughs>